Amen. What an incredible morning of worship. I'm so thankful for Mark Trammell Quartet and for Brother Fred and the music that we've heard. Let them know one more time what a wonderful job they've done this morning leading to some worship. Well, it is my honor to be here. I'm so thankful to be with you. I had such a wonderful time this fall when I got to be here, and it is one thing to get invited the first time, but it's a whole other ball game to get to come back. Uh, I know a lot of people that ruined it on the first run, and I'm glad I didn't do that, and I will try not to do it again today. Uh, when I asked Brother Jerry, when he asked me to come, um, I really, I don't make a lot of, I don't make any requests, really. Who am I to make any sort of requests? But the only thing I ever ask, this is the fourth time uh, in all of our ministry that my my dad and I have preached at the same time in the same place. And the only thing I ever ask is, I want to go first. Yeah. So Brother Jerry, my people are going to be contacting your people. But it really is an honor to be here. I feel a little bit, I told someone earlier when I, uh, I made the mistake of looking at the lineup of who was going to be here preaching. And uh, if you ever watched Sesame Street or had a child who watched Sesame Street, they had a little skit where they put four squares on the, scene, on the screen and there'd be three policemen in the squares and then there'd be one fireman and they'd sing a little song. One of these things is not like the others. <laughs> this, uh, this week you have a who's who of preachers and I'm more of a who's that. But uh, <laughs> this is one who's that, who's thankful to be here. So I'm gonna ask you to take your Bible and open up to Mark chapter five. Brother Jerry, I really am honored to be here. Some of my heroes are here and will be preaching this week and I'm just thankful to be able to be here and be a part of it. Mark chapter five, the title of my message this morning is this, Ministry in Motion. Ministry in Motion from Mark chapter five. I'm gonna read the first 20 verses. God's word says, then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been pulled apart by him. The shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. And he cried out with a loud voice saying, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now, a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2000 and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled and they told it in the city and in the country and they went out to see what had happened. And then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine. Then they begged, then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got in the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. He, he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. Let's pray together. Lord, I'm coming to you this morning humbly because I need you. God, I pray this morning that you would allow me to say what the Bible says. God, I don't want to say any more or any less. I don't want to put in what I want to be there or take out what's hard for me to deal with. God, I pray that I would be able to preach clearly this morning, your message for this moment, for this gathering of people. And God, I pray this morning that you would give us hearts that are ready to receive, ears that are ready to hear. God, I pray that you'd move me out of the way and that you would take center stage. And we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. I mean, I live in Jacksonville and uh, serve on staff with my dad in Jacksonville, Florida. We're in Northeast Florida. And if you're not familiar with Jacksonville, you can find us right in the middle of 9 million interstates. Uh, Interstate 95 splits us in half from North to South. Interstate 10 splits us right across the middle there making a bullseye. And then we have a beltway 295 that wraps all the way around. 
And because of all those interstates, at any given moment, there are about 7 million 18-wheelers on the roads of Jacksonville, Florida. It's great. And because of all of those 18-wheelers and where we're located, on the north side of our town near the state line and on the south side as you're heading towards more interstate, you'll find on both sides a rest area and a way station. Now these are two very different places that accomplish two very different tasks. The way station, if you've ever driven by one and you're not familiar with what it's all about, every vehicle over a certain weight is required when the light is on to stop at the way station. Now at the way station, you don't go to stay. You stop, you get a checkup, if you will. They investigate your vehicle, they inspect it to make sure that it is able and safe to be on the road, make sure that you got air in your tires, that all your lights are working, that the cargo that you're carrying is legal, and that you are supposed to have it. And once, they make sure that you have everything you need to accomplish the task that you've been sent out to do with that truck, they send you on your way. But not far from that way station, you'll find a rest area. And at the rest area, you'll find some of those same 18-wheelers parked because those guys have to sleep at some point, and they're there resting. But also at the rest area, you don't just have guys with their trucks parked sleeping. You got folks out walking their dogs, going to the restroom, buying a snack, some having a picnic. And what I believe is that when we look at the church of Jesus Christ, what God wants us to be is a way station. We come, we pause, We allow the Holy Spirit to inspect us, to make sure that we are ready, willing, and able to do what it is he has called us to do, and then he sends us on our way into this world that needs to hear the gospel. But too many churches have become rest areas, places where the people of God have come and parked, and we're napping, and we're snacking, and we're walking our dogs, really taking a break while the world is lost and going to hell. See, Jesus Christ, his ministry was always in motion. You find Jesus from the moment he steps into his public ministry, going from place to place and person to person. Now, he did occasionally stop. He did occasionally take those moments to rest and recharge, but he always kept moving and he never stopped because he came here to seek and to save that which is lost. And folks, this world is full of a whole bunch of lost. And we find one of these moments here where Jesus is on the move. And I believe that we should be following the example of Jesus as we go out into this world to take the gospel. It hadn't been easy for Jesus up until this point. Before we arrive in Mark chapter 5, you can go back to Mark chapter 3 and you see that the early days of his ministry were not easy as he's proclaiming the truth of who he is and what God has sent him to do. His family thinks he's crazy. It literally says in the middle of Mark chapter 3 that his own people go and they try to take a hold of him because they say he's out of his mind. We know him. He's not the son of God. We know where he's from. We know who raised him. He's lost it. But the religious people, they didn't just think he was crazy. They said he's not just crazy. He's possessed by the devil. He's evil. He's out here. He's preaching heresy. And so he's got a family who thinks he's crazy. All of the religious people think he's evil. And he's just gotten himself in a boat. And he's going to pass through a literal storm. Much like what's on its way here this evening, apparently. And he passes through that storm on purpose. Because on the other side of that storm was someone who was worth it. He went into that storm, leaving behind all the naysayers. Because on the other side was someone who needed what only he had to offer. And this morning, I want you to notice four things about the ministry of Jesus, four things that we should be modeling as we leave this place this morning. Here's the first thing we learn about Jesus. There is no place he will not go. There is no place he will not go. Look at verse one. I love that little phrase right at the beginning of verse one. It says, then they came to the other side, the other side of the sea. Now to you and I, that just seems like a minor detail, but to the disciples who were in the boat, it was a really big deal because on the other side of the sea where they were headed was a place many of those disciples had never gone before. You see that other side was a place where the Gentiles were living. It was a Gentile area where they were raising pigs. And I guarantee you, every one of those men in the boat with Jesus, all of those disciples at some point in their childhood had had a conversation with their Hebrew mama that went a little bit like this. Don't ever let me hear about you going to the other side of that sea. 
They're raising pigs over there. There's unclean Gentiles over there. They're worshiping pagan gods over there. Don't you ever let me hear. You know what? Matter of fact, don't ever let me catch you looking at the other side of that sea. It was a place they did not go, a place that they would have actively avoided. You see this in the life of the disciples over and over with the ministry of Jesus. Jesus says that I must needs go to Samaria. And they're going, we don't go to Samaria. Constantly wanting to go the long way around because there were neighborhoods and towns and places where good godly people just didn't go. But Jesus went. Jesus set his eyes on them and he went there with a purpose. See, the disciples would have systematically avoided this place. It was a pig farm. It was clearly off limits. It was an unclean territory full of pagan people. And it's exactly where Jesus takes them. And this is the question we have to ask ourselves this morning. Where am I not willing to go for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ? See, we have churches that say that we are here to fulfill a great commission, a great commission that says to go into most of the world, some of the places, a few of the countries. No, it says to go into all of the world. And if we're going to be a church that fulfills the great commission, you know what? There are no zip codes that are off limits. There are no places that we cannot minister. See, we've got to start asking ourselves as believers and as churches, are we only going to do ministry on this side of the bridge? Are we only going to reach the people on this side of the tracks? Are we only going to reach the people who look like us and talk like us and spin like us? Are we only going to reach those who are comfortable to us? Because you see, Jesus Christ, for him, the planet that he came to save, there were no boundaries he was unwilling to cross. He was crossing and breaking boundaries and barriers because when he saw the world, it wasn't separated by zip codes or state or national boundaries. He wasn't looking at races or religions or creeds or he wasn't looking at any of that. He sees us as two things, lost or saved, sheep or goats heading towards heaven or headed towards hell. We are either his or we are not. And he came so that all would be saved. And so I've got to ask myself, am I going about my ministry and my walk with the Lord the way Jesus did? And if there are places that we are unwilling to go, then we're not ministering like Jesus ministered. So not only is there no place that he will not go. Secondly, I want you to see there's no person he will not help. No person he will not help. Now, as they're heading over to this place, the disciples had to have thought, well, if we're going over to this Gentile territory, at least we're going to the good part of town. See, where they were going, it tells us at the end in verse 20 that they're going to Decapolis. It would have been the capital area, if you will, the central location where the business happened. It was all obviously an affluent, wealthy part of the region because there was a pig farm there. And a pig farm with 2,000 pigs was someone who was fairly well off. And so the disciples, I can only imagine, were thinking something along the lines of, well, if we're going over to this Gentile, okay, at least maybe we're going to be talking to the folks who were important. The folks who have influence, the folks who have prestige, and maybe we're going to reach these influential people so those influential people can reach the rest of these pagans and we can get out of here. But when their boat lands on the other side, their first customer was not who they were expecting. See, it tells us in the Gospel of Matthew that there were actually two demon-possessed men that they encounter, but here in the Gospel of Mark, we're only focused in on one of them. And so for our purposes this morning, we're going to focus on that one as well. But two demon-possessed men come violently and loudly running out of the graveyard, and they're headed right for Jesus and the disciples. And I can only imagine if I was there and I was one of the disciples, my move would have been this. It's all yours, Jesus. <laughs> you got this one. We didn't even want to come over. I'm not. When my mama finds out I'm over here, you drug me all the way over to a pig farm. I'm going to have to explain to my mama. And now this is the guy you want me to deal with. You see, when you come to church, if this church is anything like my church, and I believe that it is, we have the policy that everybody's welcome, that there is no one unwelcome here at MIMS that we want you to come as you are. 
That just as dad said earlier, that, that we don't even need you to get cleaned up before you get here. That we want everyone to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ and we want the Lord to do his work on you. But even when you have that same philosophy as come as you are, there are a few baseline requirements for church attendance. And this guy didn't meet any of them. You say, what do you mean? Well, here's the first one. If you come to North Jack's on a Sunday, we expect you to wear clothes. I'm not saying what kind of clothes. You can wear a suit, you can wear a tie, you can wear a no tie, you can wear a coat, you can wear no coat, you can wear jeans, you can wear khakis, you can wear shorts. Just something. Some church clothes. Any church, it clothes are church clothes. You can't come naked. That's what I'm getting at here. This guy comes running out of the graveyard. He doesn't have a stitch of clothes on. You can come to church in whatever kind of suit you want to wear, just not your birthday suit. That's the way it works. You got to have clothes on. So that's the first requirement. You, you got to come clothed. This guy doesn't check that box. Now, the second one is if you come, we're going to ask that you conduct yourself appropriately. Now, this guy, he's screaming to the top of his lungs. Now, there's a difference between shouting for the Lord and screaming like a wild person. And I promise you, if you show up at Mims on Sunday morning naked and screaming, some of these fine men with the little earpieces in their ear who talk into their sleeves... They are going to escort you out one of these side doors and have a conversation with you. And not just that you, you, you act, appropriate, but that you treat people with respect. These guys, it says when you read the, the parallel passage over in Matthew and you read here in Mark, it says that they wouldn't let anybody get near them, that everybody that tried to get their hands on them, tame them, control them, put them in jail, they whipped their tails. They beat up anybody they could get their hands on. And I'm telling you, if you show up to church on Sunday morning, no clothes, screaming like a maniac and beating everybody up, we're going to have a conversation. Now, here's the fourth one. If you are currently in the custody of the local law enforcement, we do not want you to escape and come to church on Sunday morning. <laughs> Our churches have ministries where we will go see you. If you make a bad decision and end up in jail, we'll come see you there. But you can't go, I can't miss church. I'm busting out of the joint. Here I come. And this guy says that the only thing he wore were accessories, broken shackles and chains. So he's, he, everybody that's tried to chain him, control him, he's broken apart from all of those things. So no clothes, screaming like a maniac, violently beating up everybody he can get his hands on. Anytime anybody tries to put him in some form of custody or control, he breaks out of that as well. And this is who Jesus has highlighted as his top prospect for visitation. <laughs> I promise you, if you come to midweek visitation here at Mims and Brother Jerry goes, hey, uh, the local crazy guy who's got no clothes on screaming down by the gas station, that's who I want you to go see tonight. <laughs> yeah, I'll send you my letter. I'm moving. I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. And this is who Jesus is after. He's powerful, he's violent, he's demon-possessed, and Jesus goes to him. The first person that Jesus is going to minister to. And as I asked you the previous question, is there any place that you're unwilling to go? Are there folks that you've determined are too lost to be saved? See, this is the last guy anybody would have expected to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And yet he's the first one that Jesus Christ goes to. Why have you stopped praying for him? You've got that spouse and you had prayed for decades, but you stopped. Have you determined that they're too far gone? Why have you stopped praying for that son or for that daughter? Why have you stopped inviting that neighbor? Why have you stopped having that conversation with that coworker? Why have you given up on them? That person that the Holy Spirit right now has right at the forefront of your mind, you can see him clear as day. And you used to pray for him. You used to talk to him. You used to invite him. But you stopped. Because somewhere along the way, in our hearts, we've determined they're too far gone. They're too bad a case. They're a lost cause. 
But I'm telling you with Jesus Christ, there is no such thing as a lost cause. And this gentleman here is proof that there is no one in your life that is so far gone that Jesus cannot find them in their mess and save them. And God this morning wants to ignite a passion in you again for their lost soul to pray for them and love them and go to them. And in the middle of their mess to bring the gospel and the light of Jesus Christ to them. So there's no place he will not go. There is no person he will not help. And praise God, there is no power he will not overcome. There is no power he will not overcome. This man is not just possessed by a demon. He's possessed by a legion of demons. As best we can tell, historically, a legion of soldiers was about 6,000. We don't know exactly how many demons this man had, but he had a whole bunch of them. And they controlled everything about his life. Now, I want to be careful here because the Bible doesn't give us a total explanation about the psychology and the physiology of demon possession. And I want to warn you, if you get bogged down in that, it will drive you crazy. Here's what I do know. It's what Brother Steve Gaines, I heard, preached so powerfully last yesterday, that Jesus Christ is Lord even over demons. That no matter how powerful these demons are, they are not more powerful than Jesus Christ. And when Jesus comes on the scene, there is an immediate conflict and clash between light and darkness. And these demons understand both of us can't be here at the same time. Somebody's going to have to leave. It's clearly going to be us. So please just don't cast us into oblivion. So Jesus initiates this encounter with this demon-possessed man. And what he does that I think is so incredible is Jesus cleanses an unclean Gentile land of its unclean spirits via the elimination of some unclean pigs. And you say, well, why on earth did, did Jesus cast him into the pigs? It's such a strange detail in the story. I believe for two reasons. One, I wanted to believe that Jesus wanted to give proof of the miracle that had just taken place. The demons were there, and now they were clearly there. They were clearly possessing this man. Now they've clearly possessed these pigs, and they have run off the side of this mountain and drowned themselves in the sea. But you know what else I believe? That in doing so, those two men watched their demons run away from them. That Jesus made it perfectly clear these demons are no longer in control of you. They are no longer with you. I have not only cast them into this swine, I have eliminated them completely by casting them into the sea. Because this is what Jesus came to do then and what he comes to do now. Everywhere that Jesus goes, he conquers all of his enemies and he sets captives free. And I want you to know this morning, there is no stronghold or sin in your life that is too powerful for Jesus Christ to overcome. There is nothing that you are in bondage to that Jesus Christ cannot set you free from. And what I want someone in this place, see, I believe for sure there's a lot of Jesus-loving, church-going Christians. Is it? You come to Bible conference on Friday morning, there's some Christians here. But I believe that anytime you get a group of people this big together, there's some who aren't. And somebody needs to hear this this morning. This guy had everything the world would tell you is freedom. Nobody told him what to do. Nobody could control him. He got to do what he wanted when he wanted to do it. There was no human being that gave him any sort of instruction that he had to answer to. But what we find is that what the world calls freedom is actually bondage. And the things that you are chasing that you think are giving you an escape, that you think are giving you freedom, that you think are giving you some sort of relief from the hurt that you feel deep down, those things that you are chasing and calling freedom are the shackles that Satan is using to keep you in bondage. There is no bottle that can give you freedom. There is no pill that can give you freedom. There is no amount of pornography that can give you freedom. There are no amount of relationships that can give you freedom. What you find is that this man was not free until he submitted himself to the Lord Jesus Christ. What I love is when the people show up, they are astonished because they find this man where he is seated, he is clothed, 
And he is in his right mind when? When he places himself at the feet of Jesus Christ. The paradox that this world does not understand is that true freedom is found in submission to a person named Jesus Christ. That freedom is found when Jesus Christ delivers us from all of the bondages that this world tries to keep us in chain to. And this morning, you are chasing freedom in all sorts of things that are going to ultimately destroy you and what will set you free this morning morning is to surrender your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. You need to be forgiven. You need to be set free. And the only one who can do that is here. And his name's Jesus. There is no power he cannot overcome. Now, you would think that the citizens of that city, seeing what they had seen, this, this, these two demon-possessed men who had terrorized them, there were areas of town you couldn't go because they were there. Jesus shows up and in a moment, he sets them free. You would think that they would give Jesus the key to the city. Thank you, Jesus, for coming here and freeing us from this terrible oppression. No, they want Jesus to get out of town because Jesus messed with their money. Jesus puts a hit on their bank account, all the pigs are in the ocean, and no matter what Jesus did in the life of this person, their business was more important, so they want Jesus to get out of here. And what amazes me is that he grants their request and then in turn denies the request of the man who's been set free. A very strange ending to the story. You see, if I had written the ending to this story, here's how it goes. Well, first of all, the first version that I would have written, all of the people come out and go, Jesus, 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 thank you for all that you've done. But the people say, we want you to leave. Now, if we get to this part, I would say, well, Jesus, you want me to leave? I'm not leaving because you need to hear what I've got to say. But yet then there's this man, when Jesus does go to leave, he says, Jesus, I'm begging you. You've set me free. Please take me with you. And Jesus turns to that man and he says, no, you don't get to come. So why on earth would Jesus grant the request of the people who want him to leave and deny the request of the one who wants to go with him? It's the fourth thing, because not only is there no place he will not go, there is no person he will not save or help. There is no power he will not overcome. Here's the beautiful. There is no person he will not use. There's no person he will not use. On the day of this man's conversion, Jesus instructs this formerly demon-possessed man. I love the way he's described when you go through the end of the story there. It says, when they came to see Jesus in verse 15 and saw the one who had been demon-possessed, who had the legion, sitting and clothed in his right mind, they told him about what happened. And it says there in verse 18, and when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed, see, he's not demon possessed anymore. See, he used to be known as the demon possessed man, but now he's known as the one who used to be demon possessed. And what's incredible is that man, he goes down as Jesus is loading up in the boat. And as the boat's about to pull away, Jesus says, now, sir, I'm so excited for the conversion that you've had today and the decision that you've made. So I wanna tell you what the next few days are gonna look like. First, we're gonna need you to come and participate in our four week new believers class. We've got some curriculum that we're gonna take you through. And once you finish our new believers class, we have got three months of evangelism explosion training we're gonna have you do. We got some verses we need you to learn. We've got a few outlines we need you to memorize. We're gonna give you a New Testament and we're gonna need you to mark the Romans road. And once you complete that, we are going to keep our eyes on you for six to 12 months. And once you prove yourself worthy, we're going to consider letting you greeting here at the local church on one Sunday every quarter. He says, go today. On the day of his conversion, Jesus puts him into service for the gospel. Now, I hope that you know, listen, our church has a new members class. Our church teaches evangelism training. We believe in accountability. I don't think that if somebody gets saved Sunday morning, you ought to give them next Sunday morning sermon. But I do think that we have become so structured to agree that, that we go, well, you know what? You got to prove yourself and before. And what we do is we choke the life, the light, the joy, and the excitement out of new converts. 
when what they're ready to do is to unleash this passion that's been turned loose inside of them. And this is what Jesus does. He says, no, you can't come with me because you have to go tell them. You've got to go tell them. These people that you terrorize, nobody knows you better than they do, and they need to hear from you all that I've done for you. See, the message that he gives him to convey is very simple. He doesn't say, I want you to explain all of the complexities of the, the, the prophecy and eschatology. I want you to explain all of the difficult passages in the Old Testament law. He says, no, I want you to go and you find it there in verse 19. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion or mercy on you. I have to be very honest with you. I wrestled with a lot of insecurity and a lot of nervousness about being here today. I was not, I, I was joking, but in that joke was some truth that when I look at the lineup of pastors and preachers who you are going to hear speak this week, when I look at it, they have got more degrees than I will ever have. Some of these men teach other pastors to get the degrees that I've got. They have preached to much larger crowds than I will ever preach to. Some of them are experts on the biblical languages like Hebrew and Greek. Many of them have pastored for longer than I've literally been alive. But I've got one thing on them. There is not a preacher or pastor in this lineup who is a better expert on how God has shown grace and mercy to Josh Revis. No one who is preaching this week knows my story better than me. No one in this place knows better what God has done in my life. And there is no one who can tell my story like me. See, nobody else was sitting in the seat I was sitting in as a pastor's kid who was 15, who knew a lot about Jesus, but didn't know Jesus. There's no one who has seen the work that God did in my dark heart. There's nobody who knows and understands my sin like I do. Nobody knows how much bondage I was in like I do. And I am here to tell you that God has been merciful and gracious to me. And I want you to understand your story is not ordinary because the work of salvation is extraordinary. That the ordinary is extraordinary because when God brings about life where there was nothing but death, there is nothing ordinary about it. And you may never preach on grand stages and you may never write a book. You may never sing to stadiums full of people. Listen, if you do, you do it and you do it to the glory of God. But for the rest of us, what you have to do is go tell your story because there is nobody who knows your story better than you. You've got to go back to those friends that you used to run with because there's one thing they can't deny. They can argue with you about scripture. They can argue with you about eschatology. They can argue with you about hypocrites in church. But you know what they can't argue with? They knew who you were. They see who you are. And you're telling them that Jesus is the one who did it. And there is no arguing that fact. So what this community needs is a group of people who understand who they were and who they are and who brought about that change. And they take that simple message to a world that is lost and dying because there is not one person you say, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know how bad I've been. You don't know the laundry list of mistakes that I've made. Here's what I know that no one is disqualified from the love of Jesus Christ. And once Jesus Christ saves you, he has set you apart and you are no longer who you used to be. They are things that you did, but they are not who you are. You are not defined by those decisions. Your identity, you are a child of God adopted into his family. You have been bought with a price. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You were a sinner, but now you are a saint. You have been declared righteous by God. You are justified. He is sanctifying you. And one day he is going to glorify you. And he has set you on a mission not to park your truck in a pew and rest, but to get your truck in gear and get this world the gospel. The great missionary Hudson Taylor was recruiting folks to be a part of his missionary work. And there's a one-legged school teacher from Scotland named George Scott. 
And this one-legged school teacher named George Scott approached Hudson Taylor and offered himself for service in China. And Hudson Taylor looked at him and said, with only one leg, why do you think of going as a missionary? And George Scott answered, because I don't see those with two legs going. The only thing I have to ask you this morning is why you got your truck parked. Listen, is there somewhere you're not willing to go? Are you willing to go where they are? Do you believe that Jesus can save them? Do you actually have a story to tell them? And if you do, you proclaim it with every breath until your last breath, until your eyes close here and you see him there. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. God, I pray in this moment, there may be some folks in this place. They don't have a story to tell. They've never been saved. And God, this morning, you could begin writing a new story for their life. A brand new story that begins with salvation at an old rugged cross. And I pray if there's a person in this place who doesn't know Jesus as their savior, that this morning would be the morning that they repent and believe and are saved. God, I believe in this place, there are a lot of Christians. And God, I believe that you've pricked all of our hearts at some point this morning through the incredible word that dad preached through this feeble message that you gave me the opportunity to share. And God, I pray for those that have got their truck parked, that God, you get it in gear this morning, that God, you'd erase the boundaries, that God, you give us eyes like you have to see people in only one of two ways lost or saved, hell bound or heaven bound. And God, that you would ignite us with a passion to get the gospel to this world that is lost and dying. God, let that work begin in me. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.